The story of Noah is one of those stories we all have heard, we all know, and we all can tell it in about two sentences. God saved Noah and all the animals in a big boat. Really, that's one sentence, I guess. And that tends to be how we tell it. Well, there's a bit more to the story. We start reading the story a little bit, the lead up to it. We read that it starts with God seeing that all that humanity was doing was evil. And God was sorry, and out of that sorrow says, I will blot out humanity, for I am sorry that I made them. Noah was the only one who found favor, for he was a righteous man. God told Noah, I am bringing rain on all the earth, so make an ark, a boat, and for this rain will be a deluge and all will die. And I will protect you and your family and all the animals you bring. And there were 40 days of rain then, and the ark floated on the waters, and all that were in the land died. Then God paid attention and remembered Noah. And the wind blew across the waters, and the waters abated, and Noah tested to see if there was land out there, sent out a dove, which returned with a branch. Noah left the ark with all that were in it, and built an, offer, built an altar and made an offering to God. And when God smelled that offering, God gave the promise that never again will I curse the soil on account of the evil of humanity, and giving the sign of the rainbow as a sign of this promise. Then Noah began again, started the family farm up, and as his first order of business, he planted a vineyard. And as soon as he could, he made wine and drank so much he passed out. That's the story of Noah and the ark, right? We listen to the story, and as details start to fill in, it's not quite as warm and fuzzy. The fact that Noah responds to what's happened by drinking as much as he can, as quickly as he can, that hints at how bad he was traumatized by this. And indeed, I think traumatized is the right way to think about it. A combination of survivor's guilt and just having gone through it. All those bodies had to have gone somewhere. And what, what happens with dead bodies in water? They float, right? And then, uh, you ever see a picture of what it looks like after a flood recedes? It's bad. Noah's art, it, it's a fascinating picture. If you, ever, if you go on Google, you can search by image. You look up images of Noah's Ark, and you will find two completely different types of pictures side by side. You'll find pictures of, like the picture on the bulletin cover, pictures of uh, just stylized, bright, like elephants and rhinoceroses looking out the side of the Ark. Everything is beautiful and pretty, right? You'll see the stuff that you would use to decorate children's nurseries. And so, not right next to it, you'll find search results that are of like uh, 1500s and 1600s paintings of, of the moment when the ark door is slammed shut and the floodwaters are coming and people are running to get on the boat and people are falling off into the waters and there is terror on the faces of everyone in the picture. It's kind of schizophrenic the way that we tell the story of, of Noah's ark. It's, it's all cute and fuzzy. Oh my God, what's happening? Like it, it, it's... Ooh, right? And so we have questions when we start to read Noah's Ark, especially you read it as an adult and you let it just kind of dwell for a moment. And so we're going to ask a lot of questions today. And if you have a question, I will gladly take a swing at answering it. I make no promises that I'll be able to. But uh, I'll give you an opportunity in a few minutes to ask a question. Uh, some, some questions about Noah's Ark can be answered and others not. But here are a few questions. Let's have a few questions, right? First, did it happen? I, I think that's a legitimate question. Did, Noah's, did the flood happen? Well, if you go back into ancient cultures, ancient Near Eastern cultures, you, um, you find the, the Enuma Elish, the, the Epic of Gilgamesh. You find, if you go back into Akkadian and, and Babylonian and Sumerian stories and myths and legends and history, all of them have a flood event. All of them, right? And so somewhere back in the cradle of humanity, in what we now call the Middle East, there was an event that involved a lot of water. 
So I am fairly certain that some sort of flood happened that flooded all of the known world. And it's all of the known world. That, I think that's an important thing to say. Because it can't have been a worldwide flood, because if it was a worldwide flood, if the water came in, there would be nowhere for the water to go and we'd still be flooded. Or if it, if it was a worldwide flood and the, all like water was like leaking out of the atmosphere, the world would have dried up long ago. So it was a flood of all of the known world, and it did happen, because every culture tells us it did happen back then. Um, now, another question you might ask is, should we try to find the ark? Mount Ararat, right, is where the ark lands, we're told. What do we find? If you go on an archaeological dig, the fact is you dig. Things that are preserved tend to be underground. And the ark landed on top of a mountain. And so I don't think we're going to find it. A, because it's underground. B, if you found some old wood on top of the mountain, how do you know what it really was? And C, y'all know farmers. Let's just do a quick reality check. If you have landed and you have to rebuild the farm and there's all the trees have been swept away and you have this big old boat back here with all this cleanly cut lumber, how many days do you think it was before Noah had that torn apart to build his, his farm, right? Two days. I give it two days before he had that sucker started to be torn apart. But I don't think anyone is looking for the ark. I, I just say, just relax. Don't, don't worry about it. it. It's okay. I do wonder, how did Noah learn to build the ark? I mean, that, that shipbuilding is not an easy trade. Uh, he was a farmer, not a carpenter. The other thing, uh, another question. I, uh, I wonder, how long was the silence when Noah walked off the ark? Right. We know what Noah did. Noah walks off the ark and he goes and he builds an altar and he makes a sacrifice to God. But what we don't know is like when he walks off the ark and everything he knows is gone, how long does he stand there in shocked silence? We don't know. It's not a question we can begin to answer. I have two questions we do have to answer, though. If we're going to read, every time we read something, we bring our assumptions to it. We read it in a certain way. And here are the two questions that each of us, if you're going to read Noah, the story of Noah and the ark, you have to answer these two questions uh, to know how you're going to read it. So, here is the first question. When you read Noah's ark, do you read God as angry and lashing out? Is this a story of punishment? Well-deserved punishment of humanity who has gone from being declared very good in chapter 1, like God creates the earth and says, that's good, that's good, that's good, gets to humanity and says, ah, that's very good. And to have gone from very good in chapter 1 to uh, all that humanity did was evil upon the earth in chapter 6. Is this God out of a fierce anger punishing Right? Perpetra the perpetration of this great evil upon the earth. That's how some people read this. This is God being angry. Or do we read this as God experiencing a horrible grief, like the grief of a parent whose children have strayed far, far away? They start reading it like this. I mean, how long do you weep for a child who is left? Right? You start really thinking about that, and you think that God wept for the 40 days. And, and why did the rain stop? Because you weep for a season when a child has left. I, I don't want to push that analogy too far. Any analogy eventually breaks down. But I, personally, I lean towards we, reading this as God as the, the weeping, the, the grief-struck parent in this situation. The other uh, decision we have to make when it comes to reading this is what changes? Like, on either side of the flood, there is a change. Before the flood, God was willing to use the flood to wipe out all of humanity, or to take away, wipe out all, all of humanity except Noah, right? After the flood, we have the promise. We, this isn't going to happen again. What changes? Like, the, and the, the, the way you answer it, the change is either in God, or the change is in our understanding of, of God. And so, okay, if, the, if what changes on either side of the flood is God, what that means is God grew up. 
right? On one side of the flood, God looks at this and says, I don't like it. I'm going to wipe it all away and we're going to start again. And there are some people who read the flood as sort of God's teenage years. Like, I'm not going to do it anymore. And then on the other side of the flood, well, that didn't work out so well. I'll do better next time, right? There are some people, theologians, pastors, Christians, who read this as sort of God's maturation, God growing up. Mm. Another way uh, to read this is to think that it is our understanding grows. It is not what is being understood that changes. And the way to get at this, uh, to understand this difference is, um, when you were five years old, did you know whether your parents had any hobbies? No. Right? When you're five, all that you know about your parents is, is that they take care of you and that when you need milk, they holler, or you holler and they come and get it. Right? Now, when you're 25, you look back and you can say, ah, my parents were fun back when I was five. And what changed is not that my parents changed, it's that my understanding changed, right? And so the thing being understood doesn't change, it's that our understanding changes because you look back and say, oh, my parents knew what they were talking about. My parents had hobbies before I was around. My parents have fun, right? And so in the same way, what we can do with scripture is say, that scripture is a story of God revealing God's self over time. And throughout the story of scripture, the people that God is raising up get better and better and better at knowing who God is. So that by the end of scripture, we find God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit moving for the salvation of all people. Well, this isn't at the end, is it? This is all the way at the beginning of scripture. And so at the beginning of scripture... If it's the equivalent of a five-year-old writing the story, how, how accurate of a story do you get? Right? And it's not saying that the five-year-old doesn't tell the story as best as he or she can. It's just saying that if you go to the beginning of Scripture, there might be moments where we say, you know what, this, it's not that God was quite like that. It's that that was the best that could be understood in that moment by the people experiencing it. Does that make sense? Right? That it's not that God changed, it's that our ability to understand God grows. I, and, and I hope, you know, by the end of the New Testament, you hope that people are better able to discuss who God is, God's character. Now, you can probably guess where I, I land on this. I, I, I land on, I believe that this is the story of a, a weeping God who, uh, and it's not that God was angry and grew out of it, it's that we don't fully understand what's happening. But if you disagree with me, that's okay. Like, there, there are some of these questions, there's not, I'm not going to, I don't know what's right and what's wrong. I believe reading stories like this reminds us how much uh, we are Israel, right? The nature of following Jesus, the nature of being a, a disciple uh, of the God revealed in the Old and New Testament is to know that we are part of Israel. And to be part of Israel... Israel means struggles with God. That, that's what the word itself means. Israel struggles. El is the short version of Elohim, which is God. So to be part of Israel, to be part of the people who follow the God as revealed in the Old and New Testament, is to be part of a people who are always struggling. And, and when this first shows up, it's when uh, Jacob is wrestling with an angel, and, and at the end of wrestling with the angel, he, he wrestles all night, and he demands a blessing, and he is blessed, but he walks away with a limp. And I think that's about right. That In our struggles with God, we may be blessed, but we might also end up with a limp, because we're not quite sure how it's going to go, and it might mark us, and, and how we struggle with it. I, I, it is okay to struggle, because it is what people who, who walk with God do. We struggle to understand. Stand. Now, I say that. Are, do you have any questions? That's the non rhetorical. Like, seriously, you have any questions about Noah and the ark? Come on, stump the pastor. Oh, come on. I love a good question. Oh, oh, hold on, Georgia. Go for it. You figure out who's going to talk. When do you go for it? Mm -hmm. A Christian scientist who said the flood was all around the earth, and they have proof of it, but atheist scientists refused to admit it. 
Yeah. You know, I, I'm a scientist. And what the, what the is, is that all the things that have been done into the earth, when they get to the same level, they are still in the same You know the challenge. The, well, the problem with that is just simply conservation. I'm a scientist. Put on my scientist hat. My parents paid for me to go to Truman. It's worthwhile every once in a while. Uh, conservation of matter. Like there just isn't enough water on the Earth to flood the entire Earth. And if there was, where did it go? Like there, it just doesn't work. It, it, it's. I, I'm sorry, and, and we can look at the map of it later, but. There can't have been a universal flood because we're standing on dry land right now. Dan. Yeah. Well, of course, one theory is there was a huge lake uh, in the Ukraine and so on. Mm-hmm. One of the areas south. Yeah. But that doesn't explain why there's a story of the flood in Australia. Well, and the, the question is, is now you're getting into, is the story of cultural movement, cultural, cultural stories, how do stories move? But I, I think that's a far more accurate way to think about it, is to say, so often in scripture, it is not a question of, there are things that happen, and it is the prophet tells you it's going to happen, and, that, and then it happens when God said it was going to happen, and, and you go, of course, God was behind that. And so that the uh, lake let, lets go and floods all of known creation, known, key word there, Great. I want to hear more about that. Not right now, after afterwards. <laughs> so any other questions? Shoot. My son and his family visited the park as it's gonna be the first time. Yeah. And he said the massive was what hurt the class. Here's the funny thing about the measurements. It's all given in cubits. And a cubit is the length from the tip of the king's hand to the elbow. Do you see the problem with this unit of measure? What if your king's short? <laughs> or shorter than the last king? <laughs> so the cubit, it was a really big boat. I'm not debating that. What I am saying is, it's big-ish. And we're not exactly certain, because the, the units of measure are, are all off from shift from kings. I'd love to go there sometime. So any other? Okay. Um, having struggled and floundered with this, let me tell you the story one more time, and maybe on the other side we'll, we'll find, a, find a way to land it well. Noah was a righteous man among a generation that was not, and he showed that the righteousness of Noah was that he showed that obedience was possible. In his day, in his time, this is an example of how righteousness is sort of a comparative thing. Ten generations down the road, we'll come to Abraham. And Abraham, the righteousness of Abraham, like he argues for the good of Sodom before God strikes it. Does Noah argue for the good of his neighbors? Like, hey, could we not kill the smiths? I'll make a bigger ark. Now, we don't hear that. What we hear, Noah never says anything. What Noah is, is obedient. And so we see that uh, that's what was needed for that moment. And so when God, greatly sorrowing, as a parent weeping over, way, over a wayward child, looks around and sees Noah, Noah trusts God enough to walk into a dark boat that has no rudders and no oars, and, and to stay there while God weeps for 40 days and it rains. And then God remembers Noah and, and we get this, this phrase that, uh, and the wind moves across the face of the waters. If you go back to Genesis 1, what you read in Genesis 1 is the spirit, the, the wind, which is the same word, spirit and wind, moves across the face of the deep, the face of the waters. This is a new creation again. This is starting again. The, the wind moves across the waters and it begins. And what Noah sees, uh, he sends the dove out and the dove comes back with the olive branch, which to this day becomes our, the symbol of hope and peace. And this peace is rooted in this promise that God gives that... God will never flood everything due to humanity's evil. 
and I think it's an important qualifier. It does not say there will never be another flood. What it says is the flood, is, you, you don't ever have to worry about the flood being the response to your evil, to your actions. And, and it, we end up wrapping up with the rainbow, and I think that is the important thing to end on, because it's, it's the rainbow. That, that's, we will question and ponder and struggle with this story forever. We will never stop pondering seriously, Noah. But at the end of the day, we have the rainbow, and what inspires us and draws us on is not complete understanding, but the beauty of what's in front of us. And I think as Christians, we see that, right? We do not have complete understanding of anything about the Christian faith or about what Christ said. If any of you can ever explain Mark 13 to me, please do. That chapter has annoyed me for over a decade. I can't make heads or tails of it, right? But what draws me on is not whether I completely understand Noah or whether I completely understand Jesus. What draws me on is the beauty of God's promise, the beauty of the rainbow, the beauty of how Jesus gathers people at the table and gathers them to create peace and community. In the end, the punchline of Noah is not how well we understand it, but how well we follow the rainbow towards the beauty of what God's plans are for us, his children. Amen.